So hello and good afternoon everybody. My name is as Christina said Peter Brokvist and I represent Uppsala University and in particular Essence in this uh, context which is a strategic collaborative research program in e-science in Sweden uh, which links very well to the today's presentation and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this Battery 2030 plus excellence seminar where we today have one distinguished guest speaker which is Professor Christine Persson from the University of California Berkeley in the US. But uh, as given by Christine's Swedish name, she is actually has a history here in Sweden, which is quite interesting. She did a PhD in, uh, at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, where she studied under the supervision of the Swedish physicist during Göran Grimwall, who is known to many, at least of, uh, to many of our of, uh, as engineers in Sweden. Uh, after her PhD, she went to the US and has stayed there ever since. She is today uh, the Daniel M. Telep Distinguished Professor at the University of California in Berkeley and the Director of the Molecular Foundry, which is a user facility at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. She is also the Director and Founder of the Materials Project, which is a world leading research for materials data and design. And if you haven't been to materialsproject.org, I urge you to go there and have a look. It's really worth uh, spending some time there, especially if you are a chemistry or physics teacher in the material science field <laughs> and also a researcher, of course. She has received many awards for her research. Uh, among others, the DOE Secretary of Energy's Achievements Award, which she got gotten twice, the TMS Serial Stanley Smith Award, the TMS Faculty Early Career Award, and the list goes on and on and on. So she is a very, very distinguished uh, researcher in this field. And now she's here to give us the Battery 2030 Plus Excellence Seminar entitled Towards First Principle Prediction of New Electrolytes and SCI Formation which I'm really looking forward to hear more about. So while Christine shares her screen with us, uh, I will just give some ground rules. Uh, since yeah, I'm, I'm sure that the presentation today will inspire to discussions and uh, questions, but unfortunately the format that we have today don't allow anybody to speak with Christine directly. So we have to speak through me and that you do via the Q and A button down here in your, Screen. So if you have any questions, please write them there directly and I will forward them to Christine after the presentation. So please, Christine, the floor is yours. Take us Thanks away. So, <laughs> thank us so much, Peter and Christina, for your kind words. It's really my pleasure and honor to be here. Um, I've um, um, it's I've been home in Sweden for two days and I, I miss it. So it's it's a special kind of seminar for me. And I'm also very proud of everything that Sweden is doing in the space of battery research. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work we've done in the prediction of novel electrolytes for multivalent systems and um, uh, towards going towards SCI formation, uh, predictive SCI formation. So um, that's on the menu for today. We have two different topics. Uh, new electrolytes, new salt for multivalent, and then a presentation of a new data-driven reaction network for SEI prediction. So let's start with the multivalent electrolytes. If we look at the, the timeline of electrolyte uh, development, um, since the 1980s, it started with the, the pioneering work by Novak and Gregory, looking at uh, perchlorates and, and, and borofluorides in propylene carbonate, these electrolytes did not play well with a magnesium metal anode, but they were sort of a proof of concept starting somewhere. Uh, Arabach did some really exciting work in the mid 90s with the all phenyl complex and the Grignard reagents, uh, which did work well with the magnesium metal anode. And I think he was able to show up to 700 cycles or thereabouts of um, cycling with the Chevrel cathode and the magnesium metal anode. However, the anodic stability of these electrolytes sort of reached about three volt, which isn't really enough for high energy density uh, multivalent uh, battery applications. Uh, there was a bit of a hiatus after that, um, but interest started picking up again after 2010. There was work from Toyota, uh, again, involving fluoride-based electrolytes 
There were some startups, including Talion with the Mac electrolytes, again, in sort of the order of three volts, uh, higher voltage window. Um, and then people started suggesting that TFSI might work. There we have a higher voltage stability. And there's been a rapid development of exciting work since then with the borohydride development from Toyota, the alkoxy anions from Arnold and Fickner, and recently also the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research in the United States. So I'm gonna sort of talk about that part of the electrolyte development where things have sort of picked up and people have gotten excited about many different things. In particular, I'm gonna to try to highlight what we think we have uncovered as, as some of the design metrics behind why it's so difficult to find electrolytes that work both with the metal anode as well as having a high electrochemical window of stability for these multi-electron transfer systems. So in order to do that, to set the stage, if you go back to sort of early literature, and even today, you occasionally see pictures like this in the literature where uh, the sort of prevalent view of how a lithium ion or thereabouts electrolyte works is you see the sort of working ion surrounded by some solvent complexes and the anion isn't really anywhere to be seen. Um, I think our, our understanding of this is evolving. Uh, certainly in lithium ion electrolytes, that is the majority species that we're looking at, but the minority species may still be important. So by minority species, I mean things like solvent separated ion pairs where the anion does hang about, maybe not in the first solution sphere, but it's close. And these things are typically in equilibrium with a contact ion pair uh, kind of species where the anion actually is present in the first, the surrounding sphere around the working ion, whether that's lithium or magnesium or calcium or something else. And these minority species, which there normally are in lithium ion cases, but in other systems, they may not be anymore, can have an impact not only on transport, that's pretty obvious because it changes the, uh, the, the charge on your, on, your, on your species and solution, but also on the stability of your electrolyte. These species can have different reduction oxidation uh, mechanisms as well as stability uh, windows. And this is really important if we are to consider sort of a bottom up approach to designing electrolytes, because if one of these minority species is unstable, you have an equilibrium that feeds uh, the formation of more of those in the bulk of the electrolyte and may actually become the limiting case. So in this first part of the talk, I am using mostly molecular dynamics, classical molecular dynamics to get an idea of the solvation structure and the bulk electrolyte. Uh, and I'm using quantum mechanics simulations to get an idea of reactivity, so reduction in oxidation reactions, as well as helping me to fit the force fields for the classical molecular dynamics. So the first thing we did when we started looking at magnesium and calcium electrolytes, I mean, this is almost 10 years ago now, um, was in a, a, a starting point co collaborating with a group at the Argon Photon Source in Chicago, where they were doing X-ray pair distribution measurements. Uh, we were doing molecular dynamics and we found that there was a really nice uh, um, agreement between what we were seeing and they were seeing. Uh, which led us to the conclusion that in really fairly low molarity uh, magnesium electrolytes, so this is 0.4 molar magnesium TFSI, and we don't really don't think of TFSI as a highly coordinating salt anion. Um, uh, in in diglime, we found that the majority species was actually contact ion pairs. So the species that I'm showing here is magnesium coordinated by one TFSI and two diglime. That was found by by both simulation as well as experiments to be the, the dominant um, um, species in solution in the bulk electrolyte. So what are the implications of this? Well, if you think about the sort of, when, when, you're, when you're desolvating or plating, when you're uh, plating your electrolyte on the hopefully magnesium metal, um, in normal electrolytes, you assume that something like the lower bottom um, picture where you know lithium comes solvated by the solvent and it desolvates by these solvents and it sort of nicely plates when it gets one electron. But in the magnesium case now, if your delivery vehicle are these majority contact ion pairs, you would expect the solvent to de desolvate first because it's only it isn't electrostatically bounded to the magnesium as TFSI is, which is like a two plus and a one minus interaction. It should be stronger. So we're expecting that the delivery vehicle at metal plating for multivalent systems, if your, if your majority species is a contact ion pair will be quite different. So we were asking ourselves, 
Well, because of this, this, this difference in plating conditions, is, is the solvent going to be stable? Is the anion going to be stable under these conditions, which of course will change how the battery operates, whether you get long-term cycling and what the SEI looks like. So the beauty of computations is that you can, you can freeze parts of the electrolyte and you can add electrons and you can do different things, which may have very short light, lifetimes and experiments. But this is something that, that, that's sort of the strength of computations. So what, what we did in order to figure out whether TFSI in particular was stable during the sort of idealized plating conditions, First, we could calculate whether TFSI by itself is stable. That's sort of a, a, a sanity check because obviously it should be. So we broke the bond. So this is the bond dissociation energy where we can calculate the bond strength of all the different unique bonds in TFSI. And of course, those are all endothermic, which is very nice. They're stable. It's a stable molecule, st stable anion. And if we pair it with magnesium 2 plus, that's basically the contact ion pair in solution by itself. Again, this is a very stable TFSI. It doesn't decompose when it's exposed to magnesium 2 plus, which again agrees with our experimental impression of the system that, that just because you, you dissolve the salt in solution or in the crystal, it doesn't decompose. However, if you assume that when magnesium needs to plate, it needs two electrons, and it's unlikely that those two electrons come at exactly the same time for every single magnesium that needs to plate. There should be some statistical variation of when they come. Um, there should be some population uh, of magnesium one plus. And if you, and we can calculate that, we can literally add an electron to the magnesium uh, and see what happens to the TFSI. And this is the graph in the middle there, which, which shows that the CS bond, one of those unique bonds, now becomes quite exothermic. It really wants to break. And this is really a signature of the fact that magnesium one plus is highly reactive. It hates being that state. So what happens is that the TFSI will sacrifice itself and literally take up the electron and, and break. So if I were to sort of have a little cartoon of this, here comes a delivery vehicle with the contact ion pair takes up one electron. This is a very, very short intermittent state, so short in the fact that we have not been able to measure it. We've had people look at it, but it's very short. But what we do see in both experiments and in computations is that TFSI breaks during plating conditions. And this is fundamentally a difference compared to lithium ion or sodium ion systems. All multivalent systems need to go through some sort of stages, very, very short lived, but still, of these intermittent or intermediate charge states. This multi-electron charge transfer can in some cases when the, these intermediate charges are very unstable put a tremendous chemical or electrochemical pressure on the delivery vehicle. So in this case, TFSI breaks. So of course, this is the computations. We always need to validate with experiments. We had really good collaborators in Kevin Zavadil and Nathan Hahn at Sandia and they were able to do ex situ XPS of the, of in this case, a platinum uh, surface, where they just exposed uh, the electrolyte to um, some magnesium TFSI again in diagline here uh, to, to the interface. And they looked at the interfacial species and they were just made with carbon and oxygen to begin with, which might be coming from diagline on the atmosphere. But as they started cycling, as they started plating magnesium and, and, and uh, cycling the, the electrolyte, they saw a buildup of species, fluorine and sulfur, which really only can come from TFSI, which indicates that there's an electrochemical uh, activated process that, that breaks down TFSI. It's not just the exposure of a platinum surface polarized to magnesium potentials. And they were also able to see through uh, spectroscopy of the bulk electrolyte that, that there were fragments that corresponded to this sort of CS breakage, um, which again, sort of indirectly corroborated the modeling suggestions or prediction. Okay, so that's, we, we sort of had a hypothesis now that, that, um, that the, the difficulty in designing multivalent salts is, originates partially from this, um, from this multi-electron transfer process, which, can expose the solvation structure around the working ion to instability. Um, so how do we go about designing from computations or helping out with computations more stable anions? 
Well, we know, we think we know that we understand the instability of TFSI, but of course you also have to corroborate it on things that are known to be quite stable. And borohydride being one of those, it has a low anodic stability of two volts, it's not really viable for, for high energy density magnesium batteries, but it is known to, to work quite well with magnesium metal. And indeed, if we calculate not just borohydride by itself, but also coordinated with magnesium two plus, as well as magnesium one plus this highly reactive cation, it is still stable. This bond doesn't break. So again, this sort of, we, we, we started to feel a bit better about our hypothesis and uh, carrying that motif forward in 2015, Toyota also proposed the boro monocarburane, which has the same borohydride motif and we did the same analysis on, on, that, on that anion. And again, it sort of has the same conclusion that the bond association energy with the monocarburane, looking at all the different bonds that are present in that, that molecule, um, they're all stable, even if you expose it to magnesium one plus. Okay, so we think we have a computationally accessible metric for stability. Uh, so now we can go about trying to increase the anodic stability or the electrochemical window of some of these salts. So that we like the monocarburane, knowing that it works with magnesium metal. So we looked at the different parts that we could functionalize in the monocarburane and different kinds of functional groups that we could add and substitute in. And then we can calculate how much of an improvement in the electrochemical window and increase of anodic stability we could gain from these functionalizations. And again, this is something that computations is quite good at. We just exchange the group. We don't have to synthesize anything. We can calculate it in the computer. And no big surprise, we tried a lot of different functional groups, but of course, chlorination is known to improve the electrochemical stability. We really like the, the trifluorination, but our experimental counterparts, again, Kevin Zavadil and Nathan Hahn, were a bit skeptical whether they could make that one. So they focused uh, on the single uh, fluorinated monocarburane, which is shown here in the middle, and would gain us about 200 millivolts, pretty modest, but still we thought it was a good proof of concept um, that if we could make this one, it should have higher anodic stability and hopefully also uh, we were able to calculate that it would still retain its, um, its stability against the magnesium one plus or the plating conditions. So this was a promising, we believed anion with a, a, with a slight modification from the Toyota model. And uh, Nathan was able to make it and purify it. And uh, you can see the result at, uh, on the right there. We compared to the original monocarburane and the fluorinated version shows a nice clean uh, plating and stripping profile. So again, seems to work quite well. It retains its ability to work well with the metal. And this is in triclime. Um, okay, so does it do better in terms of anodic stability? Yes, again, fairly modest, but the, the, the response is there about 200, 300 millivolts of an improvement uh, compared to the existing monocarburane. And, and this was something that sort of was, was similar to what we computed uh, from first principles. Okay, so that's one way of trying to improve the, or trying to design novel anions that, that even when they're contact ion paired with, with the multivalent cation like magnesium, has, withstands the sort of this really difficult intermediate charge state. But there is another design metric out there, which um, the, the community um, uh, suggested. What if I design a highly weakly coordinating ion that doesn't hang out with magnesium much at all, then I should be able to stay away during that difficult plating situation and maybe I'll stay stable. So the use of weakly coordinating anions took, took, took an interest. And uh, I think they believe the first versions of this came from Arnold and Fickner, which uh, they, they, uh, they suggested these electron deficient alkoxy borate and aluminate anions. Uh, we can see a picture here. You have the sort of the borate center and or aluminum center and these uh, beautiful ligands with highly fl fluorinated ligands. Um, uh, in this case, two of uh, two CF3 group coordinated to each arm of the of the ligand. Uh, these were able they will show they show that these work quite well with magnesium metal, not perfectly, but quite well, um, and also increase the the electrochemical window. 
uh, in our group or together with Kevin Savadil again and Nathan Hahn and a bunch of people from the Joint Center of Energy Storage Research, we um, added yet another CF3 group to this. And, and we at Argonne, they were able to synthesize the TPFA anion, which has this aluminum center and these large bulky uh, um, ligands that really um, doesn't like to hang out with the, with the magnesium metal in solution. And as a computational sort of evidence of this, you can see here that we calculated the Gibbs free energy of the uh, coordinated version. So magnesium coordinated to a, a contact ion pair versus solvent separated. And uh, TFSI, which is again, not known for being a highly coordinated anion, you can see that it actually likes to coordinate with magnesium, but TPFA is highly resistant to it. So this is truly something that uh, will have a very, very small presence of contact ion pairs in the solution. And indeed, it's also predicted to increase the electrochemical window of, 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 your, uh, of your solution, of your battery. So in that sense, uh, we were hoping that this would be a good, good uh, electrolyte for magnesium application. And indeed, you can see here from the, uh, from the Columbic uh, uh, measurements that it does show quite, quite decent cycling and stability. It's not perfect. Um, and we, we think we know why. And this goes back to what I, what I originally started with, that even if you have a highly weakly coordinated anion, if you, the, the very small amounts of TPFA that will be contact ion paired, because there has to be some, right, uh, in any chemical equilibrium, will be unstable when it's exposed to the plating conditions. So you will have a very small minority species that keeps being chewed up every single cycle, which is where the, where the columbic inefficiency comes from. And indeed, we see that there is fluorine content after cycling on magnesium metal anodes surfaces, which corroborates the fact that this, there is a slight amount of instability. That being the case, this is still, when we test high voltage cathodes at Berkeley, this is still our go-to electrolyte. So, but it's, as far as I know, it's still not available commercially. You have to make it yourself, which makes it a little bit difficult. Anyway, I hope I've shown you some promise in um, designing and understanding the instability of these complex electrolytes from first principles and working together with experimentalists to improve the performance of these systems. So my topic number two is presenting a new data-driven reaction network methodology for SCI prediction. And um, the challenge of SCI, understanding the SCI, I believe Christina is one of the, he's one of the experts on this. She's done some really tremendously exciting work about characterizing the SCI that, that I'm very grateful for because this is something that we can compare to when we try to predict from first principles how it happens. This is a challenging, uh, uh, area because the SCI is a spontaneous electrochemical reaction that happens at the beginning of the first cycle, so nanoseconds, but then it keeps reacting hours and even days of the aging of the SCI. From a modeling perspective, that's highly challenging because most of our accurate modeling techniques do not extend to those kinds of timelines. We also know that it's highly sensitive to small changes in the electrolyte and the electrode materials. You, you add a little methyl group to one of your solvents and suddenly you have a completely different SCI with different properties. We desire it to have very specific functionality, even though we have very little control of how it forms. We want it to be electronically passivating, thin, and exhibit selective ion transport. So we want the working ion to go through, preferably as fast as possible, but nothing else. So if the anion goes through, then we usually wreak havoc on the electrode material, your anode. And this, this SCI, despite our lack of control, dictates battery operational voltage as well as life. So it's a very, very important problem. Um, from a modeling perspective, um, we have in the past have several tools in our toolbox that we can use to, to model uh, electrolytes. And and their decomposition mechanisms. We have shown you already that you can use quant quantum mechanical density functional theory to calculate reactivity. But as I showed in my electrolyte part, you, you kind of have to tell the system what to do. Okay, I wanna break this bond. I wanna examine when I coordinate this with whatever molecule, what happens? Does it react here? What, what's the voltage of adding an electron and so forth? So it, it sort of 
It relies on the intuition of the modeler. Uh, ab initio molecular dynamics exposes a little bit more of like, let's just put these molecules in a box and see what happens. So slightly less of a bias from the modeler themselves, but on the other hand, the accessible lifetimes today of those simulations is up to about 100 picoseconds. And that's really not enough to truly examine the configurational landscape and reactivity of a true electrolyte. To give you a sense, just the solvent exchange, one solvent molecule exchange on a working ion is in the order of 10 nanoseconds. So we're not really there. It's just gonna look at the local configuration that you put together in your box. We have great hopes for reactive molecular dynamics and now the coming of machine learning potentials, um, but we are still to the point where we don't really know how far we can trust them. Even if we train them on first principles data, when we go outside of that training set, we have a fairly bad intuition of how, how accurate they are. And then we have classical molecular dynamics, which is sort of a workhorse. It's great for getting an idea of the solvation structure, but there's really no reactivity. So understanding these reactions that happen over large time scales and different kinds of species, we really didn't have anything that could truly address this problem. So about a decade ago, I thought that maybe now when we can do high throughput computations, maybe there's another avenue of going about this, this problem. Uh, people have done reaction networks in other systems, for example, for uh, sugar formation and very simple, simpler organic systems and showed that it can, it, it works, but no one has done it for electrochemi electrochemical systems. So imagine now that you, you put your, you, you look at what molecules you have in, in your electrolyte and you can, you can look at clusters as well and aggregates and contact ion pairs. But this sort of idealized system, you have EC, PF6, lithium PF6, and let's say impurity of water, and you expose them to the electrochemical potential of lithium, lithium metal. So you have electrons with a certain chemical potential, and it's an open system to those electrons. You can just keep adding as many as you want. And you check every single bond in these molecules under series of reductions, whether they're stable or not. You break them if they're spontaneous, and you start forming fragments, and you allow those fragments in turn to recombine and form recombinant molecules and you check every possible way that that can happen. That is a combinatorial explosion, but we do have the ability today to calculate loads and loads of fragments, electrochemically charged fragments from DFT. And now assume that you can, you can, you can track the, the, the thermodynamically downhill reactions in this landscape what is beautiful about such a methodology is that you retain quantum mechanical accuracy and you abstract out the time scale in the sense that it's only dependent on how many species you can include and how large of a species you can include and your algorithmic efficiency. If you can calculate up to oligomers or polymers, you could get to those hours or days of reactivity. So that's the dream. Okay, let's see how well it works. We started building this, this infrastructure. It relies on high throughput computing. Um, so we can calculate in the order of 20, 30,000 molecular fragments. They can be charged or non-charged, that's not a problem. Uh, we still can't calculate, the, even a couple of thousands of fragments will give orders of hundreds of millions of possible reactions. And then recombinant fragments, recombinant molecules tends to explode. So you still need machine learning to prioritize which bonds are likely to break or form. And that, but that is a fairly robust machine learning problem. Uh, it's not all thermodynamics. Once you have some paths you like, you have to refine them with kinetics. And we're working on machine learning kinetics, which is much harder than thermodynamics. Once you have enough of that data, you have to then start tracking which are the steepest descent in thermodynamic landscape, refining them with kinetics. We do that with stochastic algorithms and and uh, mathematically accurate models or uh, algorithms such as Dijkstra's and Jens algorithm. And once you have enough paths that you trust, you can start looking at the competition between those select paths with kinetic Monte Carlo. And I hope to show you some of the things we've done and that we're sort of getting to a point where we believe that parts of this actually does work. Okay, so the first thing you do when you have a new methodology is that, of course, you test it on existing knowledge, right? And we're very grateful for the work that's been done by other modelers, such as Perla Balbuena, who about two decades ago carefully laid out the different mechanistic decomposition paths of lithium coordinated ethylene carbonate, uh, which allows us to, to, to again, test our methodology. So we 
take a very simple system, lithium and EC exposed to lithium, lithium plus uh, metal potential. Uh, and we break every possible unique bond in EC under different coordination scenarios. We add as many electrons as, as the system wants to take up when we form these fragments and we start recombining them completely automatically without any manual intervention. And then we see where the system leads us. So this is a network with 6,000 species and four and a half million possible reactions. So our knowledge is the first electrochemical reaction network and by far the largest. So what did we get? Did we actually form LEDC as Perla um, showed beautifully uh, some time ago? And we were very happy to see that indeed her two paths, the, the double electron reduction and the ring opening do fall out of our network completely automatically. Um, so these are the, the shortest path by thermodynamics, so the steepest delta G, as well as the third shortest path. We also find other paths, novel paths. They're not tremendously different. They're sort of variations on parallel path, but it kind of makes sense that if you have something that is spontaneous and really downhill in, in delta G, you are going to find slight variations of this. There's sort of many paths to roam. Uh, one of them that I like is this uh, slightly unintuitive ring opening that is intermediate stabilized by a lithium that sort of swoops in, stabilizes a bond breaking, then swoops out again, which sort of seems quite likely that, that could happen in the bath of the electrolyte and this sort of cascade reactions that happens close to the anode when you get the first SEI formation. Okay, so we've that that's good. We've we've shown that we can recover existing knowledge without any manual intervention using this reaction network approach. So now we turn to something that is slightly more predictive or or you know getting new knowledge. Um, so there was a paper, really nice paper in 2019 in Nature Chemistry, where Kang Zhu and Brian Eichhorn uh showed the community that, that the standards we've been using for spectroscopy and NMR um, suggested that the, the, the standard for LEDC that's been used was actually not LEDC, it was LEMC, which cast into doubt whether LEDC truly is one of the early SEI forming species on, on, in, in lithium ion batteries. So this seems to be a rather important problem to resolve. Um, so we decided to set up a new network, which in this case contained ethylene carbonate, lithium, and impurities of water because LEMC has that hydroxyl group that we think that water might be an important player. And again, exposing it to the electrons from lithium, lithium metal. Um, water is a nasty species when it comes to reaction networks because it has these radicals that really likes to react with everything. So we constructed two networks, one with water and a maximum of five bond change reactions and one with without water. And the one with water went up to 9 million reactions and the one without about a half a million. And we looked at all the different paths that would form LEMC, uh, contrasting that to the known paths of LEDC. And what could we learn from that? Okay, so we found that of course, LEMC is uh, definitely a thermodynamically feasible product in the, uh, in the SCI. There's, uh, it is a downhill reaction. There's, uh, it, there's nothing keeping it from forming in that sense. Uh, the mechanistic explanations, there were some hypothesized reactions in the Nature Chem paper, and we, we confirmed them. They are perfectly valid reactions. We also found some novel pathways, and some of them are, are shown down here. But the most importantly, what we showed also was out of the 400 unique pathways that we identified, 392, so all but eight, involve hydrolysis of some sort. So water is a key player. Um, and the eight remaining ones were found to be kinetically inhibited. This isn't completely exhaustive. We couldn't go through all 9 million. We took the steepest one by delta G, refined those with kinetics. and But the vast majority of those paths involve water. And given that commercial electrolytes and even lab electrolytes these days are dried pretty rig rigorously, it seemed unlikely to us that LEMC would be a large, even that it's dependent on water in the electrolyte, a water, a major SCI product. Okay, so the last piece of this SCI business, um, let's say that now we have, we have, we put together a system, in this case, it's water, lithium, we can add impurities like uh, uh, carbon dioxide, ethylene carbonate, 
and we look at the, all the possible reactions that can form. We pick up the ones that we like from kinetics and thermodynamics, and we can now run kinetic Monte Carlo and look at the competition between them and see if we can actually start predicting or seeing by first principles alone the form early formation of the SCI. And now with kinetic Monte Carlo, to give you a sense, we're accessing about the microseconds. So a real improvement compared to the nanoseconds and picos, hundreds of picoseconds that we could do with the earlier modeling uh, results or methodologies. What did we find? Um, so in this particular case, um, with the species I just mentioned, as we form the first SCI, and I assume I have completely bare anode, right? So there's virtually no tunneling barrier. We're using Marcus theory to sort of get an idea of where, how much resistance there is for the electrons to tunnel. It's all by first principles. There are no fitted parameters. Um, we come down in potential around 0.7 volts. EC starts reducing in ring opening. The major uh, products that we see at moderate reduction rates, far away from, from uh, close, to the, uh, close to the anode, but at high potential, uh, we form mostly inorganic carbonates. Lithium carbonate and ethene are your major products with LEMC and LEDC as minority product. And again, LEMC being dependent on the amount of water. And as you come down to about half a volt, you start seeing LEDC com competitive reactions form or formation uh, as, as a product um, close to the negative electrode. So again, assuming that we have a very thin layer and, and not much of a barrier to, uh, to electron tunneling. But it's in this case, in this particular reaction, it's limited by available CO2. So now the first film that forms, if we believe these calculations and, and, and the different paths that we picked out and the competition between them, the majority species close to the electrode are inorganic carbonates with some gassing and a little bit of inclusion of organics. As that film forms, and now we assume maybe that we have a 10 angstrom film, this is something we assume that, that that's true, uh, you are gonna get a slowdown of the electron uh, so existing partially electronic insulating interface is now assumed. Uh, so far, further away from the ne negative electrode, now your lithium coordinated EC complexes survive for longer, which gives an opportunity for, for lithium carbonate anions to combine through this path here uh, and form LEDC, which wouldn't have happened earlier because then they would have just reduced and formed lithium carbonate that sort of changes the, the competitive nature of these different reactions. And this very simple, but yet informed by this large reaction network, reproduce, KMC simulation reproduces qualitatively the PLED model with a predominantly inorganic layer that then gets covered by a more organic majority layer. And this has, again, no fit parameters. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Pretty close to the end of it. Okay, so you might wonder what on earth about the salt? I've only talked about solvents. The SCI is highly dependent on the decomposition of the salt. And uh, this has caused modelers quite some headache in the past because we have been unable to find the mechanistic decomposition path for LIPF6, which is our majority salt in, in, in lithium ion battery chemistry. We know that it forms lithium fluoride, we believe that PF6 basically just donates an electron to lithium. So that's through a surface mediated reaction, that's fine. But, but after that PF5, we, don't, we have not been able to figure out how it decomposes. There's been hypothesis about hydrolysis or thermal autocatalysis. But what we really liked when we started looking at, and in order for us to add PF6 or PF5 to our reaction network, we have to know, at least I have to have some idea of how it decomposes. And we were unable to find it to begin with. We found some really nice suggestions in the literature, both by Lucht and by Sun and by Edstrom, that if you mix lithium PF6 with lithium carbonate, there should be an evolution of lithium fluoride, carbon dioxide, and you know, lithium dichlorophosphates and those kinds of things. Um, and but again, these are suggestions and 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 shown by Lucht that they've seen evolution of these gases and species but not really the mechanistic um, 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 reaction uh, behind it. So I was very fortunate to work with a, with a graduate student and an undergraduate student that spend an awful lot of time 
really just moving lithium PF5 and lithium, car like lithium carbonate around. And very careful work showing that if you exactly coordinate PF5 with, with lithium carbonate, they vigorously react. And you can show that it's a downhill with very small amount of barriers forming uh, lithium fluoride, carbon dioxide, and you basically get a, a continued reaction in that sense. So now we do know how, how lithium how lithium PF6 or PF5 decomposes, so we can add that to the reaction network. Um, we also found that lithium carbonate is not the only one, but it is the worst as far as we can see. It depends on the anionic nature of the oxygen, how, how badly it decomposes PF5. Uh, other kinds of carbonates also do it, but not quite as vigorously. And it does say something about our uh, the, the nature of the of the importance of the porosity of the SCI and and the importance of the Paled model of actually having that sort of organic protective layer, so not to expose or in or inorganic species close uh, that you, that forms close to the uh, electrode to PF six. But in the very beginning, they are right. So maybe the the, the jury is out whether how much lithium carbonate is left once it reacts with lithium PF six or PF five. Dissolving the SCI is obviously bad too, because you could also expose it to those things. So this may give us a clue on how some of these um, SCIs don't work in the future. But anyway, uh, I wanted to end with thanking everybody, my sponsors, and most importantly, my group. Um, Evan Spotty Smith and Thea Petroselli were the ones who did the, the last work on the um, salt anion decomposition. But this has been a work of many years, and you see some of the Sudarshan Vijay, Shaohui Pu, and Hetal Patel, who also helped with the infrastructure and, and the work that I've shown here. So with that, I'm just going to stop sharing, and I'll be very happy to take questions, if there are any. <laughs>